Okay, everyone, so in this video series, we will be working on vital signs, the different types of specimens that you possibly will have to collect if you're working with a client at home, talking about fluid balance, both intake and output, talking about catheter care, we're going to talk about a little bit about warm and cold applications, possible dressing changing, and as well as ostomy care. So first things first, let's talk about vital signs. Vital signs are the measurements, the temperature, the pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and nowadays we also include pain level that monitors the functioning of the vital organs of the body. A circadian rhythm, on the other hand, is that 24-hour day-night cycle. Okay, that 24-hour day, a full day pretty much, okay? So this is the ranges for vital signs uh, that we need to be able to be understanding, just looking at the oral temperature, rectal and axillary, knowing that rectal temperatures will always be about a degree higher in average than oral, and then the axillary, which is underarm temperature taking, which is going to be about one degree lower from the oral. You know, looking at blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, those are the two different numbers. Systolic is the number at the top, diastolic is the number in the bottom, okay? So we need to look at the different levels of what are pre-hypertensive to what is considered hypertensive, okay? So let's look at temperature. There are four sites where we can take them. We always understand that we want to stop using mercury thermometers. So we're using mercury-free thermometers nowadays. We also have a lot of digital thermometers out there. It's starting to be used from oral, rectal, and axillary temperatures. Um, we're trying to make sure also to let you know that you can never use an oral thermometer as a rectal, rectal thermometer or vice versa, even if you're using sleeves on these uh, thermometers, okay? So making sure that we need to learn that. Now, for a lot of the thermometers, you don't need to shake them no more like we used to back in the days. If you've seen videos or if you've seen movies where after they take somebody's uh, temperature, they shake it. Those were typically for mercury thermometers. But since we're not using those no more, you don't have to do the shaking no more. So continuing to thermometers, we also use tympanic thermometers, which are fast and accurate. Okay. Now, rectal temperature, to be able to take your temperature rectally, is pretty much the most accurate um, level of being able to find out your level of your, or your, pretty much your temperature. All the thermometers must always be clean after use, even when you're using protective covers, okay? And in addition to cleaning them, you must use protective covers as well. Moving on to pulse. Pulse is the number of heartbeats per minute. Your radial pulse is inside of the wrist and the most common site for measuring your pulse. The brachial pulse is right inside your elbow about one to one and a half inches above your elbow. The apical pulse is on the left side of the chest just below the nipple. Now when we're talking about pulse, the normal rate is between 60 to 100 beats per minute for adults. Okay, slow, weak pulse may indicate dehydration, a possible infection, or even shock. Now, when we talk about a stethoscope, other than using it to listen to your lung sounds, it's also an instrument to be able to listen about listen how your pulse is going. You know, the rhythm. Is there any abnormal rhythms that are happening? Okay? So you want to be able to make sure that you know the common pulse sites. You have your brachial, you have your radial, you have your keratin pulse, which is right on your neck. And then you also have your pedal pulse as well, which is right on your foot. Moving on, let's also talk about respiration, pretty much the breathing aspect of things. So you have respiration, inspiration, expiration, and apnea. So respiration is the process of breathing air into the lungs and exhaling air out of the lungs. Inspiration is the process of breathing air into the lungs, and expiration is the process of exhaling air out of the lungs. So inspiration, expiration. <sighs> so pretty much you can try it if you want to. The next term, apnea. What is apnea? Do you know somebody that has apnea? Well, apnea is the absence of breathing, okay? So the absence of breathing, that's what apnea means. Dyspnea, on the other hand, that means difficulty breathing, okay? P-N-E-A means breathing. This is difficulty. So when we talked about the previous term, the apnea, A is without. P 
eupnea, breathing, so without breathing or no breathing. Eupnea, E-U, that means normal respirations. Orthopnea is shortness of breath when lying down, and the only way you can relieve it is if you're sitting up, okay? So the next term is tachypnea. So P-N-E-A means breathing. Tachy means rapid, okay? So tachypnea is rapid respirations. Now, when we talk about Shane Stokes respirations, or also known as just Shane Stokes, it's altering periods of slow, irregular respirations, and rapid, shallow respirations. So talking about respirations, it consists of an inspiration and an expiration. Your normal rate is around 12 to 20 breaths per minute. You want to be able to do the counting while you're counting the pulse as well. Do not let the client know you are counting the breaths as that person may start controlling it. What you can also do is you can put your right or your left hand on their shoulder, not pushing down, but just have it there just for that touch and to be able to feel whenever there's the rise of the shoulder. That's a good way to be able to really see and count the respiration. You want to be able to report any unusual sounds or difficulties the client that has in breathing. Okay, so we're moving on to blood pressure right now. Systolic is the measurement of blood pressure. It's the phase when the heart is at work, when the heart is contracting and pushing the blood from the left ventricle of the heart, okay? Diastolic is the second measurement of the blood pressure. It's the phase when the heart relaxes or rests, or pretty much the heart fills up again. Hypertension, hyper means excess, Okay, tension is the pressure, okay? So high blood pressure. Hypertensive patients or clients are people that measures on their blood pressure having a systolic of 140 or higher or a diastolic of 90 and higher. When we talk about prehypertension, this is a condition in which a person has a systolic measurement of around 120 to 139 and a diastolic of around 80 to 89. These are pre-indicators that the person does not have high blood pressure now, but there could be a possibility that they'll have that in the future. So if hypertension is high blood pressure, hypotension is low blood pressure, and that is if there's a measurement between 100 to 60 or even lower. Now, the next word is a, is a mouthful. It's called a spigmomanometer. Pretty much, it's a blood pressure cuff or a kit. Okay, so this is what we use to be able to collect and to be able to measure one's blood pressure. Moving on to blood pressure, the two parts of it are the BP is a systolic, that's the top number, diastolic is the bottom number. So we talked about already the normal ranges and what's considered pre-hyper as well as hypertensive. Okay, when you place the blood pressure cup, you're going to place that in your brachial artery at the elbow. That's when you actually use that. There are a lot of blood pressure cuffs and automatic cuffs out there nowadays that is for the wrist. When you are using the blood pressure, the automatic one that attaches to the wrist, you want to make sure that it's placed correctly. Follow the diagram or the instructions written with it. And you always want to make sure that it, the um, kit itself is right above your heart. Okay, so let's say, for example, you're sitting down and you put it on the client. You want to make sure you raise their hands up where it's always going to be within level to the heart. So the fifth vital sign nowadays is we're talking about pain now. We want to be able to measure the pain. You know, it's very important to monitor as vital signs. And the reason why is we want to be able to know if the pain is affecting the client. Because if a pain has a high pain rate, then that could cause problems for the client to be able to function on their daily livings. So the pain is an individual experience. Everyone has their own measurements of pain, but we, not, we want to be able to accurately question and get the right information to be able to put in the client's chart, okay? Every time somebody says that they're in pain, we want to take that seriously, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about several ways to, to be able to reduce the pain. You know, if somebody is in pain, we want to be able to make sure we report it right away. We want to make sure we give them the medication if they have something for it. All right? Some part of also for pain to alleviate it is, you know, a good 
body positioning. Sometimes if a, if a client has been laying down in bed for a long period of time, maybe we need to make sure we readjust them. And this is where we talk about repositioning every two hours if they cannot position themselves. You know, if need be, do we need to give back rubs? Okay, we need to be able to ask and offer the client a warm bath or shower. Okay, we want to be able to maybe encourage the client to be able to do some breathing concentrations, allow the client to be able to have a secluded, quiet environment. And remember, once again, medication is important. If they have orders for medications, that they actually take it. We, of course, don't want our clients taking medications that they don't have orders for because that can cause problems later on. We want to be patient. We want to be gentle. We want to be empathetic when we're caring for our clients as well. Now, for height and weight, you know, typically it depends on your agency. Same thing with your uh, vital signs. Not all non-medical private duty companies expects you to take their vital signs, their clients' vital signs. It all depends on the company you work for and what is expected of you. Now, when we're talking about height and weight, we want to be able to report any weight loss no matter how small. We want to be able to see is there a significant drop in weights greater than 5 pounds or greater than 5%. What is going on with that client? Because if they're losing weight in a, in a mass scale, we want to be able to see if do we need to give them vitamins? Do we need to give them supplements? What do we need to do for the client? So when we're taking the... Hide and wait, always make sure we provide privacy just like any other procedures we do. We want to be able to provide privacy. Weighing part, we want to be able to also make sure we do it the same time of day to be able to match up with the routine. You never know. Is the client eating a large dinner at nighttime? And that's why there's a weight gain that happens every night. When we're recording the oral temperature, I want you to keep in mind, remember, where you have to use a mercury-free thermometer. Okay, this is a, it's an oral thermometer. Always make sure that you use the sleeves on them as provided or as purchased. Okay, make sure that you wash your hands before and after. It's just very much important to do that. Now, pretty much on any procedure, you want to wear gloves. You always want to wash your hands. But now if we're talking about rectal th temperatures, we want to make sure that you really wear gloves, okay? You know, you have to understand that when you insert the thermometer, also make sure that it has a sleeve and also that you actually keep it lubricated to avoid any shearing or any scratches. And in this pr procedure, especially, we want to be able to watch and offer the client privacy because we are doing something that is invasive, okay? You want, you want to be able to make sure that when you place the thermometer, you don't let it go the whole time that it's actually within that person or within your client. And also, just like any procedures, right after this, make sure you wash your hands. Now, when we start talking about tympanic temperature thermometers, okay, these things always comes with a lot of disposable sheets as well. Pretty much a tympanic temperature or thermometer is taken through the ear. You want to be able to pull up the back of the pina of the ear. That's the back of the ear to be able to pull that up when you're taking your temperature. Okay. For children, you want to pull your earlobe down before you insert the tympanic thermometer. When you're measuring an axillary temperature right under arm, right on the, on the armpits, Okay, and also understand that this is less reliable, always one degree lesser than the oral thermometers or temperature being taken. Always make sure that the site where you're about to place the thermometer, you want to be able to wipe it down before placing the thermometer. If it's wet or whatever is going on in there, if there are powder or anything, you want to make sure that anytime that you are about to do a procedure, always, always wash your hands before and after. Moving on to apical pulses. So where is the apical pulse? Where do you take your apical pulse? Before you, we go ahead and get started with that, always understand many home health aides and home care aides and home health or homemakers or caregivers, they purchase their own stethoscopes. So they can have them available in the client's home at all times. Now, if it's a requirement that you guys do that and you guys need to provide your own items, then you should have it with you. If not, make sure your facility provides that for you as well. You want to be able to emphasize that the diaphragm and the ear pieces, okay, the diaphragm is what touches your skin or the client's skin, and the ear pieces are those two things that goes into your ears, of course. 
it needs to be cleaned at all times and always between the client care. Okay, if there's any irregularities that you're hearing or you're, you're pretty much, you know, listening to, make sure you report that. Always make sure before you touch a client, you wash your hands first. It's a very much important for that. Now, moving on to respirations and taking those, always make sure that you have a watch with you, okay? A watch that has that second hand. You know, that's a mandatory thing when you're caring for somebody. You always must have watches on you. The ability to feel the pulse comes with practice, of course, when you're taking the pulse and when you're recording a respiration. It takes time, and you can practice on yourself or on a family member or a loved one or whomever. You want to be able to emphasize that a pulse less than 60 or more than 100 has to be reported to the supervisor as abnormal. You always want to observe and document any patterns and character of the breaths. And always, always, always remember to wash your hands. When you're measuring and recording height of a client, here's a couple points to put in mind. The procedure will be different for bend bound and ambulatory clients. And always remember to wash your hands. All right, here's a few more um, definitions. And what we're going to be talking about here is in regards to the several types of specimens that you, as a caregiver, a homemaker, or somebody that cares for clients at their home, has to collect. Okay? So talking about specimens. Specimens is that sample that is used for analysis in order to try to make a diagnosis. A sputum is a thick mucus coughed up from the lungs, whereas stool is the feces, okay? The poo-poo. Hat in healthcare is one of those collection containers that is sometimes inserted in a toilet to collect the measured urine or the stool so it doesn't land in the water, okay? So let's talk about routine urine specimen. A routine urine specimen is a urine specimen that is collected anytime a person voids. They brought to urinate, collect. A clean catch specimen, on the other hand, is a urine specimen that does not include the first and the last urine that is voided, also called midstream. 24-hour urine specimen. Now what that does is, is a urine specimen, specimen consisting of all urine voided in a 24-hour period. So if a client needs to collect their 24-hour urine specimen, they're given a pretty much almost like a two-liter bottle. Typically, the color is orange in it and, of course, has warning signs and hazard signs on it. Now, calculi are kidney stones. You know, you may end up working with clients that has kidney stones, and these are very, very tough to pass, and it's also very much painful for a lot of clients. So let's look at these points right here. The three types of specimens that you're going to have to possibly collect in the future are sputum, stool, and urine specimens. You as a home health aide, as a caregiver, as a homemaker, always must wear gloves when you're doing these procedures because there is always a possibility that you will be touching bodily fluids. And in a, in a couple chapters past ago that we talked about, the importance of being able to not transfer any microorganisms, especially when we're dealing with blood and as well as other bodily fluids. Always make sure that all the specimens that we collect, that we actually tag it correctly and store them correctly. Typically, you must place the, client, the client's full name, whatever their social security number is, depending on what's ordered for you. Sometimes it's just a full social security, or sometimes they just tell you to put the last four digits. They're also going to ask you to put the birth date also there. If you are obtaining this from a client in a facility, you might have to put their room number on it as well. Now, most typically agencies, you know, will have specimen containers ready for them. So it's easy for the client or the caregiver to obtain it. Okay. And if there's any questions, you can always look up all, a lot of the different instructions on how to use them correctly. Now, here's additional points you need to know when you're collecting a sputum specimen. Understand the importance of proper PPE, protective equipments, right? So make sure you're wearing your gloves. Make sure you're wearing your masks. Make sure you're wearing a gown if need be. Early in the morning is always the best time to collect sputum because when somebody wakes up, I'm sure if at one time in your life you woke up and you're a little groggy and you had a, you know, a couple thick phlegm a little bit in your, in your throat and you would have to cough it out. Well, that's typically the best time to be able to obtain a, spu a sputum specimen. Okay? You want to make sure you wipe off the excess sputum from the container, especially if it's in the outside area. And always don't forget to wash your hands. 
Now, when we're collecting stool specimens, you know, urine and toilet paper should not be included in the sample, okay? We are obtaining the stool specimen only. So remove and discard gloves and wash hands before leaving the room. Upon your return, put on clean gloves. Understand that the perineal care must be necessary if there is any stools that comes out. You want to be able to make sure that both you and the client must wash hands after the collection. Remember, in any of these procedures we do, we always want to be able to offer the client to wash their hands also. And also, you want to be able to be familiar with what specimen containers that your agency is working and using. So that when you are faced of having to collect some specimens, you already know how to use it. Okay, we're talking about routine urine specimens now. Always ask the client to put toilet paper in with specimen. Okay? You want to be able to make sure that there's no toilet paper that's placed with the specimen. You just want the specimen alone. You want to be able to make sure that you remove and discard all the gloves and wash hands before leaving the room. As a home health aide, a homemaker, or caregiver, you should wipe off the outside of the container with paper towel and label it correctly. Label it according to what your standards are for your facility. You always want to be familiar with what kind of collecting materials you're using with the particular client so you don't mess things up. And always, always, always wash your hands and the patient's or the client's hands. Now, in what we call a clean catch or a midstream catch, we need to understand that the labia of the female client or the penis of the male client must be clean before collecting the specimen. The client must start to urinate, stop midstream, and then start again so the urine collected is not the first urine voided at that time. When the container is half full, the specimen is completed and the lid is placed on it. Okay, you want to be able to wipe off the outside of the container with a paper towel and label it correctly and also remember to wash your hands and to make sure the client washes his hands as well. A 24-hour urine specimen on the other hand is we have to understand that we have to make sure that whatever we're filling up is we actually label it correctly. Okay, we want to be able to include what time we started collecting and what time we stopped collecting. Any of the specimens should always be kept cold at all times during the 24 hour of the collection process, pretty much your refrigerator. The urine from the first morning urination is discarded. The 24 hour begins after that voiding and ends 24 hours later after the early morning urination. Now there's gonna be times, right, where the specimens are kept in a special refrigerator. Other times, Okay, the collection may be placed in a large bucket of ice to keep it cold. You always have to be able to explain things carefully to the client and the family, you know, that you should not or they should not discard any urine during the collection period or the entire 24-hour collection will have to be started again. And always wash your hands before and after anything you do. Okay, let's talk about input-output, INOs as we like to call them. Intake is the fluid a person consumes on a daily basis, and output is the all the fluid that is eliminated from the body, which includes vomits, feces, urine, perspiration, moisture, the air that is even exhaled, as well as fluid balance and emesis. Fluid balance is taking in and eliminating equal amounts of fluids, whereas emesis is vomiting, the act of vomiting or ejecting stomach contents through the mouth or even the nose. Yuck. To maintain health, the body must take in a certain amount of fluid each day. Generally, a healthy person needs to take in from 64 to 96 ounces of fluid each day. That fluid a person consumes is called an intake or an input. If a person's intake is not in a healthy range, he or she can become dehydrated. Like right now, for example, I'm talking a lot. So I am outputting a lot of fluids because every time we converse and I'm talking, I'm actually exhaling and fluid is coming out. We don't see it, but it's coming out. So, of course, if somebody's talking for a longer period of time, then of course there's going to be an increased chance of me being more dehydrated. Henceforth, I'm drinking fluids while I'm actually also doing this whole presentation. Now, always understand that all fluids taken in each day cannot remain in the body. It must be eliminated as an output. The output will always include the feces, the urine, okay, and vomitus, as well as perspiration and moisture in the air that a person exhales. If a person intake exceeds his or her output, fluid buildup in the body tissues, okay? So if we cannot get rid, 
the same amount that we bring in, then we're taking in more fluids. That fluid retention can cause medical problems and discomfort. That's what CHF happens to be. So we want you also to be familiar with conversion tables. And this is something that you need to be familiar with from, from ounces to milliliters. And understand that milliliter is also known as a CC, okay? Similar stuff. So one ounce always equals 30 cc's, six ounces always equals 180, okay? So that's always a good thing to know. Now you wanna be able to remember these, remember these points when measuring and recording your intake and output for a client. You need to understand that measuring containers are necessary for this procedure. You need to know the different types of measuring items, including some that are marked in ounces and milliliters. Measuring containers should be placed on a flat surface and the urine should be measured at eye level. Never ever, ever splash urine when emptying your graduate. Also remember and understand, right? And especially when somebody is having or somebody is vomiting, we need to remember these things right here. So we need to understand comfort measures, wearing gloves, removing soiled linens, and offering a drink or toothbrush afterwards. We want to be able to provide privacy if possible. Clients may be very sensitive about vomiting in front of others. Now, always cover the basin of emesis with a paper towel as quickly as possible. Now, moving on with catheter care. Catheter is a thin tube inserted into the body that is used to drain fluids or inject fluids. A urine catheter is a catheter that is used to drain urine from the bladder and a straight catheter is a catheter that does not remain inside the person. It removes or it is removed immediately after urine is drained or collected. An indwelling catheter, that is a type of catheter that remains inside the bladder for a period of time. Urine drains into a bag. A condom catheter is a catheter that is, has an attachment at the end that fits into the penis, also called an external or a Texas catheter. So it pretty much looks like a condom and it has the same type of method of being able to place into a person's genitals is to roll into just like a condom, but it has a hole on the, on the tip that attaches to a bag. Now, when we're talking about providing care for somebody that has a catheter, pay attention to these following rules. You want to keep the drainage bag lower than the client's hips or bladder to prevent gravity of flow back, right, or back flow, because if the bag is above their bladder, so what you're doing is you're trying to do something like an enema and having the urine that's in the bag go back into the person. So you don't want that to happen because that can cause infection and irritation. You, of course, also want to keep the drainage bags off the floor, okay? You want to prevent any kinks, any twists and pressures on the tubing. You always want to make sure that you keep the genitals clear and clean. If there is any blood, the urine, or like stoppage of urine, or if the bag fills suddenly, if bag is out of place, leaks, clients' discomfort, and odors, make sure that those are being reported. You want to collect urine specimens directly from the catheter, not in the bag. Never ever collect from the bag, because why? The bag sometimes does not get changed on a daily basis. So at the same time as you have a pool of bacteria probably pooling up in there. So you want to avoid that. And that's why you don't want to also have the bag above the person's bladder because what happens is you're bringing bacteria inside the person. Same thing at the same time as there is buildup there already and you may actually have a false reading when you actually collect those urines. So you want to make sure you're collecting that you're collecting specimens coming directly from the Foley catheter, so you would have to clip onto the bag to keep it closed, detach it from the Foley catheter, and collect urine specimen from the catheter itself. Urine is an inspectious waste matter and must be handled with gloves on and disinfected with solutions of bleach and water. So if you have any spillage, you have to make sure you clean it up correctly, okay? So why is it important to offer fluids to clients who have catheters in place? Well, the most important thing to understand is that we're actually draining them with fluids. We're, you know, we're really measuring things. So we need to make sure that we're replacing the person with fluids, okay? So we need to make sure that is done correctly. 
Also, I, I need to repeat this again, and I will always repeat this, is wearing gloves and wash your hands when providing any type of catheter care. You want to be able to make sure you're familiar with what an actual catheter is, what a tubing is, and drainage bag look like. You want to make sure that you use soap and water or antiseptic wipes when you're actually wiping the catheters. You want to be able to make sure you wipe down the tubings away from the body, never towards the body. You want to be able to wipe once and use a new wipe or clean area of a washcloth each time. You want to be able to remember you wear gloves and wash your hands. So now we're moving on to emptying a catheter drainage bag, you know, the bag that collects the urine. The drainage system is a closed system so that no infection can enter. It must remain a closed system even when being emptied. The drain spout should be cleaned with alcohol every time it is emptied and open so that the bag remains lower than the client's hips. You always want to observe urine for color, smell, clarity, and amounts. Okay? You want to be able to remember to wear gloves and wash your hands as well. Now when you're changing condom catheters, you want to be able to leave a space between the drainage tip and the glands of the penis. You want to be able to make sure the condom is secured to the penis with a special tape applied in a spiral manner. But also when you actually apply the tape that you also make sure that you don't make it tight too much that you actually cause uh, restriction okay, or constriction. Remember to wear gloves and always wash your hands. That's very important. Okay, Moving on to what we call warm and cold applications. All right, So heat relieves pain. It reduces swelling, it elevates the temperature in the tissue, and it also increases blood flow, bringing more oxygen and nutrients to tissues. The cold stuff now, they stop the bleeding, they prevent swelling also, and relieves the pain and brings down high fevers. So if you look at the cold and the heat, the heat reduces swelling, cold prevents the swelling, okay? And we want to be able to make sure that we are using the right applications at the right time. Anytime that you actually make something too cold or too hot, you want to be able to observe the area, okay? Are there any blisters coming up? You know, that means possibly did you use something that's really, really hot? You know, is there increased pain in that site for that person? We want to be able to understand and we want to be able to measure and we also want to document what we actually see and hear and we do. Okay, so here is a typical graph of what you need to know. So you can pause this video just to take a look at it further. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the benefits of warm and cold applications. So we want to be able to understand in warm compresses, we, know, we want to be familiar with any commercial type of warm compresses, whether it's a plug-in compress or if it's one of those warm compresses that you have to kind of break a seal to be able to mix two different chemicals to create the heat. You also want to be able to consider using plastic wrap to keep the compresses warm and wet longer and to prevent getting the bed or the client's bed clothes wet. When we're administering warm soaks, we have to understand the importance of using the correct temperature. You don't want it to be higher than 105 degrees Fahrenheit and you don't want it to be on the person or have the person there for longer than 15 to 20 minutes. Now the client may feel chilled, so use a bath blanket. You also want to carefully add warm water to basin periodically to keep the water continuously warm. Now, let's talk about using a hot water bottle. You also want to make sure you want to pay attention to the temperature. When you're using a hot water bottle, it's a different temperature used for an adult than for a child. Also, same thing for about the amount of time. We need to make sure that we read the rules and as well as what's covered in regards to how long it should be on. Always want to cover the water bottle and check the skin every five minutes. Okay, it alleviates the you know a little bit pressure from the skin, but to be able to reassess things as well. We want to practice filling the bottle and pressing out the excess air at all times. Another procedure we should talk about are sitz baths. It's a procedure given, you know, is for the use of a you know a sitz bath. So when we're doing a sitz bath, 
we have to understand what this is going to do. It's going to help out with, you know, any swelling, with any joint pain. And, you know, SIDS baths are typically ordered by a therapist or by the physician for them. When we're providing somebody a SIDS bath, okay, we want to make sure that you are always wearing your gloves, you washed your hands, you should always be familiar with the types of equipments being used. Everything will vary at times because there are different companies that will actually provide the products for this. So when we're using ice packs now, you want to be able to know that the ice bag should only be filled two-thirds full and never filled completely. You want to be able to, you know, remove the excess air in it. And you also want to make sure that whatever you're using has to be always covered. Always make sure that when you put the ice pack on an area of your skin that you actually check it always for several, you know, within like about 10 to 15 minutes every time you have that on a person. You want to pay attention to the skin. Are there any blistering happening? Are there any paleness? Are there any white or gray skin or discoloration that's happening? Now the client may, may feel chilled, or obviously they should feel chilled if they have ice packs on them. So a blanket is always suggested to be able to be there. And remember that it should not, be re it should not stay longer than 20 minutes. So now we're talking about cold compresses. So you can add ice and then you can add water to it to keep it cold. But always remember that when you're using cold compress, always allow and give the client a blanket. Now for cold compresses, because it's directly in the skin, there's always that risk or that greater risk for blisters and paler white skin. So make sure for cold compresses, we're actually checking the client every five minutes instead of every 10 minutes. The next thing we are going to be discussing is how to apply non-sterile dressings. So why do we provide sterile dress, non-sterile dressings? Why are we putting dressings on a site? Well, the reason why we're doing that is we now have an open site and if you have one of those, you can increase the chance of getting an infection. So by having a site such as that, we can actually, and we actually put a dressing on a wound, we are actually trying to prevent the access of a microorganism to be able to enter that site and possibly cause an infection. So you always want to make sure that you are actually changing your gloves every time you're about to do something. You always want to be able to observe the dressing, the wound for odor, the amount of color of drainage, and any redness or swelling that's surrounding the area. You only want to touch the outer edges of the dressing when you're applying it and never in the center. You always want to make sure that when you're applying dressing, you always are washing your hands. Now, let's talk about TED hoses. I'm sure you've heard this before or also known as an anti-embolic hose. What this does, it prevents any swelling and blood clots and promotes circulation in the feet and the hands. So typically when a client has poor circulation and they start having edema or swelling in the lower extremities, they have anti-embolic hoses, also known as TED hoses, that we actually put onto the client when they're up and they're out of bed. But when they get back in bed, we typically remove that from the client because, you know, they are laying flat. So moving on to ostomies. So what is an ostomy? An ostomy is a surgically created opening from an area inside of the body to the outside. A stoma, on the other hand, is that artificial opening in the body, okay? A colostomy, that is a surgically created opening through the abdomen into the large intestine that allows feces to be expelled. And an ileostomy is a surgically created opening into the end of the small intestines to allow feces to be expelled. So let's think about this question, what are the different body locations of the three types of openings and why is care of the skin and the stoma so important? Well, the most important reason why the care for the stoma is important is because, you know, anything that comes from the inside of our body, whether it's urine or species, has a high acidic rate. So if, you know, stools, for example, or urine is touching that area, that can cause some irritation and we should always clean that out. So some of the careful guidelines when we're caring for somebody with an ostomy is you always want to observe for any changes in the skin. It's very important. You want to be able to empty and clean the ostomy bag whenever stool is eliminated. You always want to wear gloves, especially when you're dealing with body fluids. 
you know, skin barriers can be used depending on the facility that provides it for you guys. You know, food blockage can occur if large amounts of high fiber food are ingested and if the food is not chewed well. So we want to make sure if somebody is actually using a um, colostomy, we want to make sure that that person has adequate fluids and at the same time we monitor that actually they're not having any blockages. So encouraging fluids is important to somebody with a colostomy or any ostomies. Now there are going to be a lot of clients out there who are embarrassed about having an ostomy because there is a differentiator about you and another person. So always, always provide a privacy for that particular client. If there's any odors that are coming from the client, meaning it's escaping the area, we need to report those to our caregivers. We want to be able to report any changes in color, amount, frequency, or even odor in the area as well as whatever is coming out. We need to be able to, you know, look into things and make sure that everything is working properly. In a lot of cases, the client is very experienced using the ostomy equipment and will even teach you about their products. So you want to be able to at least have a general look and a general feel of what is actually being used for that particular client. So we just literally covered a few information here. I hope that we're able to share that with you guys and be able to give you guys some information. You know, we, we covered a lot of different topics here from vital signs to different types of specimens that we collect, you know, the intake and output as well and catheter care. And then also talking about non-sterile dressings, warm, cold applications, as well as ostomy care. Now, keep on watching our videos. There's going to be an examination right after this particular section. If you have any questions, always, you know, shoot over an email to us and we would love to be able to answer that for you. So keep on watching our videos and thank you so much and you guys will be able to be educated on how to be able to provide great care for clients at the comfort of their home. So that pretty much ends this particular section. I hope you guys keep on watching. Remember past CNAnow.com, we know we offer over 1,500 tests and quiz questions, over 23 skill videos online. You have your online instructor that provides educational materials such as these. We have a variety of videos that is going to be able to help you guys pass your CNA examination with your state. We also give you guys some free handouts and free job guidance when you guys actually get your CNA exam. So once again, this is Michael here with PassCNAnow.com. Thank you so much and just keep on watching our videos and I guarantee that you will pass your examination.